Thanks, everyone. I think this is a very different topic for all of you, but uh, of course, you know, one of us can't do without one of you. So it's a very collaborative relationship. Um, the missing gaps are purely, I mean, all of you have protocols, all of you know, you know, what is it that you're expecting out of your therapists. But these are gaps that I am seeing after 18 years of my practice, because I think we are seeing a lot of failures. We're seeing a lot of rehab failures, and I'm getting patients after failing one, two, three phases of rehab. So I'm going to, the slides are purely gaps, all right? So don't expect very technical rehab protocols here. It's purely just things that probably you've not heard of before. So obviously rehabilitating the body as a whole. Um, this is, we learn in biomechanics, we learn it in kinetic chain, and you know, we know we have slings in the body. So there are muscles working as agonists, antagonists, but there are also muscles working to keep us upright. It's very simple. We were four-legged animals, we became two. What's keeping us upright? The slings. So these are slings that we as physios have to incorporate when we are retraining uh, your patients after surgery or even prehab, doesn't matter. And really, you know, if it's upper torso, we know which groups to make sure that we're not missing. And if it's a lower torso, same thing. So really a study, you know, a simple example of study with 415 athletes with knee issues. We're given just four hip extensor exercises and 85% resolution, you know, had resolution in symptoms. What that's telling me is really, what am I missing when I'm rehabilitating a knee? You know, it's the middleman. So I'm missing ankle, I'm missing core, I'm missing lumbar pelvic stability, and which is why we're looking at slings. So as you can see, there's obviously an anterior oblique sling, a posterior, and uh, we have a deep longitudinal sling as well. Again, it's just for your information, so you know whether your physio is actually incorporating these things when they're you know designing their protocols with you. The kinetic chain. This is where we find a lot of the missing pieces of the puzzle. So really, it determines which areas need to be addressed in the rehab of the athlete. And these are basically extremities, can, you know, sh they should be uh, treated as a very rigid overlapping segment, which has multiple successive series of muscles and joints. So it's not just joints, we're looking at muscles, joints, ligaments, and neural. Both upper and lower torso work concurrently through the middleman, which is the core. And sadly, in any rehab, be it ankle or be it neck, we always incorporate the core. There is impossible to get rehab done without making sure that that person's core is working or not. Uh, they should, we need to focus on really eliminating kinetic chain defects. Without that, again, a rehab is incomplete. And, you know, following the proximal to distal rationale, where we address both upper and lower impairments. A logical progression, obviously, as we know, is we move from flexibility to mobility to control strength proprioception, and endurance. Again, it doesn't mean just in sports. Though I'm talking on sports, we even incorporate these principles in somebody even who's 50 with, uh, you know, ONE. So really what I'm looking to say here is the entire chain has to be looked at. A big, big elephant in the room, sadly. It gets missed out, and it's, there's, not much, there's not much study on this, but there is so much um, that we see, and I'm being, I have seen over the 18 years, that, you know, why are we missing out on body types of people? You know, if you are operating on somebody who's had a, you know, ACL injury, and a footballer who's fabulous with their strength, they're lifting really heavy in the gym, they're able to kick a lot of goals. Problem is, if that person has hypermobility syndrome, and that's a syndrome, by the way, researched, right? And, and they name it L or Stan loss syndrome or whatever it is. But the idea is, if they are generally a lax and a hypermobile person, their muscles are going to work three times harder to get the same result versus somebody who's not hypermobile. So what I'm getting to is that I cannot miss somebody who's hypermobile and treat them the same way as somebody who's not hypermobile or even hypomobile. So what we're looking at is, you know, the, the, I don't know if you've heard of it, we use the Baton scale, which is, you know, if they can touch their thumbs to the back of their forearm, if they can touch their palms flat on the floor, if they're able to, if you can see the elbow angulation as literally a V. So there are seven points in that scale, and we're looking at five out of seven being positive as being a hypermobile patient. If I'm treating your hypermobile patient, my rehab program is going to be very different to a very standard ACL reconstruction or a standard meniscal repair. 
Uh, on the other hand, obviously, the very stiff ones will be treated very differently. Somebody who's excessively stiff, who cannot even go past their knees, their hamstrings are never going to give way. They're never going to switch off. And if hamstrings don't switch off, their glutes are not going to function. If their glutes are not going to function, their knee is not going to unload. So you can imagine what happens with somebody who's excessively stiff. And this is genetic, by the way. They're born like this, all right? Or maybe lifestyle-based. But if they are genetically hypomobile, we are not going to get the result with the same protocol again. Again, that we were using for somebody else. The rehab for every person obviously is different purely because their muscle recruitment pattern is different. So for us, that's very important. Is that muscle actually firing? You know, if I'm making them do a VMO exercise, is the VMO actually firing? Probably not, clearly, because the hip flexors are taking over. So that's what I want to look at when I'm looking at the person's body type, is are they actually able to have that muscle recruitment pattern corrected at the end of their rehab? Just a few examples, these are not studies, these are purely our patients that we saw after them failing rehab. So clearly, you know, this person was a very simple left shoulder, you know, um, uh, multiple dislocations and I sent them off and they had surgery. Now, obviously, pre and post-op, the focus was very similar. He did have, luckily, prehab with us, so we knew what to expect after surgery. Now, the only few three points I wanted to make sure that I'm covering is shoulder and scapular mobility strength was obviously done, but core and feet and ankle biomechanics equally. Why? Because he's a footballer. I can't miss that. And when he's running, just the shoulder's not going to be enough. Dentist, recreational footballer again, Twisted uh, the knee, did not have surgery, went conservative, but did basic physio and did not progress. So obviously, what we were looking to make sure we're doing and incorporating, this is a very extensive program that we incorporated, but this is what will get repeated in a lot of patients, depending on what we find, hyper or hypermobility. So really, individual work, isolated work, then putting them into functional patterns is what I'm looking at. He, he, he achieved return to sport within three months with us. Same, you know, national level table tennis, she had an ACL reconstruction done. Unfortunately, twice rehab didn't work. She came to us a year and a half later, severely hypermobile, no upper body rehab done, and lots and lots of fear avoidance behavior. So as physios, we do talking a lot. We call it CBT, but it's literally counseling them. Last two. Thank you. Professional footballer again, you know, had two ACL reconstructions done, continued to have pain over the two years that he was on and off off field and really professionally you know he couldn't go back to playing for two years so all i'm trying to say is return to sport after three months he was pain free purely because we found these gaps the left ankle stiffness the poor lumbar pelvic uh, stability the limb length discrepancy poor ro thoracic spine rotation so these are the gaps that we really look for we don't look for just quad strength hamstring strength or calf strength recurrent shoulder dislocation sorry this guy's extreme i know he's had surgery with somebody I know here, and obviously the full body rehab is what he needed because severely hypermobile again. I could not miss out on his shoulder, neck, ankle, and feet. So basically, just to summarize, obviously there's no one size fits all, unfortunately, so protocols don't work. Prehab works wonders, so please send your patients to us, at least just for an assessment if you like, not for a full-fledged prehab, so we can give you an idea. Lots more than what meets the eye, like I said, the elephant in the room, so lots of hypermobile to hypermobile patients. And no rehab protocol is complete without addressing the gaps in the kinetic chain, so obviously we're very holistic in the approach, otherwise it never works. They're going to be back in a year or two, for sure. Thank you. Really appreciate it.